2011, a year that will live in infamy in the realm of meteorology, a record-breaking year for climate extremes in the United States and across the world itself, a year defined by major natural disaster after major natural disaster, and yet, not many people outside of the realm of weather seem to remember how devastating and historic of a year 2011 was. However, the most significant event of that year happened today, 10 years ago. 10 years ago, where a total of 343 tornadoes over the span of 42 hours touched out across the United States, killing hundreds during the storm's wrath. 10 years ago, when I looked up at the TV before I got on the bus to go to school to see what happened the day before and was the event that began my passion for meteorology. 10 years ago was the April 2011 super outbreak across the eastern United States. Welcome to Nature's Fury. First, a little context behind what already happened so far in the realm of meteorology in 2011. Before the week of the 27th, the month of April was already a violent month for severe weather. Before the outbreak, there were already roughly 411 tornadoes total that month. It already was a record for the most tornadoes in the month of April, closely approaching the previous monthly record holder of the most tornadoes in a single month, May of 2003. From April 14th through the 16th, a major outbreak of tornadoes occurred across parts of the Midwest, through the Southeast, and along the Mid-Atlantic coast. From that outbreak alone, there were a total of 162 tornadoes, most of these tornadoes occurring in the southern U.S., from Mississippi to the Carolinas. People who are unfamiliar with meteorology would be confused at first, because it's commonly taught that there is one tornado alley, spanning from South Dakota south into the Texas Panhandle. However, recent years have showed a downtrend in tornado frequency in traditional tornado alley, and rather, there's been an uptrend towards the southeast, with the most dramatic increases being in Alabama, Arkansas, Kentucky, Illinois, Missouri, Mississippi, and Tennessee. But let's focus on the southern states here. Contrary to what most know, there is a secondary tornado alley centered over the southeastern United States called Dixie Alley. In order to understand what happened on the 27th, I need to explain what makes conditions so favorable for tornado development in this region. So, what exactly makes conditions so favorable for tornado development in this region of the United States? There are a couple of reasons as to why. The first and most notable reason being the Gulf of Mexico. The Gulf starts to heat up throughout the year, specifically around late March. This heating up of ocean temperatures in turn brings warmer temperatures to land near the Gulf of Mexico, and an increase in moisture from the Gulf of Mexico towards the north. The added moisture also means that the majority of tornadoes in Dixie Alley are rain-wrapped. Upper-level wind patterns in the atmosphere and the jet stream also create a wind shear that supercellular thunderstorms can take advantage of. Not to mention that compared to traditional Tornado Alley, the energy these storm systems have are continued into the overnight hours, due to the area's adjacency to the Gulf of Mexico. Tornado threats in Dixie Alley tend to be overnight events, making it more dangerous because it's harder to see tornadoes at night. All of these conditions allow for favorable conditions for severe weather outbreaks in the southern U.S. to be common in early to mid-spring and late fall. Before the outbreak even began on the 25th, predictions on the atmospheric conditions during the outbreak were nearly perfect for tornado development in the southeastern United States. Before the outbreak, it was predicted that a powerful upper-level low-pressure system would move through the northern plains of the United States, and the associated cold front would tap into the unstable conditions of the southern United States starting on the 25th and ending on the 28th. For the 27th specifically, Cape levels were estimated to be anywhere from 2,500 to 3,000 joules per kilogram, and with the positioning of the jet stream and strong wind shear expected across Mississippi into Alabama meant that conditions were nearly perfect for tornadoes to develop. And the scariest part is, the models got it wrong. They didn't make the conditions perfect enough. To explain the more nitty-gritty details of what made this outbreak so nearly perfect, I'm going to hand this off to Noah from Ports 13 US to explain the specifics before I continue on with what the situation was expected to be day by day. So now we're going to take a look at reanalyzed soundings from USTornadoes.com that will show us the environment those tornadoes were in. Here we have a sounding that is near where the Heckelberg Air 5 tornado touched down and looking at the skew T on the left we can see that from 500 millibar all the way to the equilibrium level the skew T is almost completely moist adiabatic but below we have a very pronounced dry layer in the mid levels. That's our elevated mix layer and that's very important for our cape. Um, so far south in Dixie Alley it is very difficult to get a significant cap so your risk for cloud cover and convection throughout the day that hinders your instability is very high. And here this dry layer in the mid-level clears the sky, steepens the lapse rates and basically acts like a cap until 
the instability is so strong that storms fire in the afternoon and here the cape is almost 3500 joules per kilogram. Okay, let's look at the photograph. This here is a storm relative photograph. All we do is put the storm motion to the origin and you have a storm relative photograph. That basically shows the wind the storm is actually feeling. And this photograph really shows a perfect wind shear profile. It has a very nice balance between a strong storm relative lower level flow with almost 50 knots at the surface and this this very big low level hump with almost 700 SRH from 0 to 3 kilometers but we also have strong upper level storm relative flow and that keeps the rain away from the updraft and doesn't choke off the updraft and that means we have a very persistent supercell updraft that eventually produced a violent ER5 tornado for more than two hours on the ground. And this tornado had this very scary and ominous look to it with this rain-wrapped low scuddy base that made the tornado practically invisible until it came crashing down in your house. And you can see here on the scooty partly why this was the case. First the LCLs are extremely low at 400 meters above the ground and also the LFCs are exactly above the condensation layer which makes this very scuddy convective look to the cloud. And here on the sounding for the famous Tuscaloosa tornado we can see why it wasn't looking like Hackleberg. First the LCLs are a bit higher and also the lowest layer of the thermodynamic profile is far less near saturation as the Hackleberg sounding. So these two differences probably made up for the very different look of those two. The Storm Prediction Center on the 25th looked at moderate chances for severe storms in the lower Mississippi Valley and it upgraded high risk for areas within the same region on the 26th. On the 27th, the Storm Prediction Center issued an outlook of a high risk over eastern Mississippi and most of northern Alabama, with a moderate risk in place from Mississippi into parts of Kentucky. Most notably in this outlook, issuing a 45% significant tornado probability over parts of eastern Mississippi into the north central part of the state of Alabama. The 28th saw the system weaken as it left Alabama and western Georgia, but still a severe threat for the east coast of the United States throughout the daytime hours. For the 27th, the morning hours would see a squall line of severe thunderstorms forming from Mississippi into Alabama, tracking eastward. In the afternoon, the formation of multiple discrete supercellular thunderstorms with the potential of strong violent tornadoes along eastern Mississippi into north central Alabama. With the 28th seeing the remaining storm system seeing severe storms into Georgia and up the east coast. Meteorologists such as James Spann warned locals in northern Alabama of the chances of severe weather on the 27th days before the event even began. But at that point, the outbreak had already begun. On the 25th of April, the main focus of concern for the chances of tornadoes were in Arkansas, Missouri, Oklahoma, Texas, and Louisiana, with a PDS tornado watch issued for those states mentioned. Arkansas saw the most severe damage, with a large wedge tornado with a width of about 1.65 miles striking the town of Villionia, killing four people. An EF-3 tornado in Pulsakee County going over the Little Rock Air Force Base, injuring one. There were numerous cases of flooding and damage from high winds from the lower Mississippi Valley up into parts of the Northeast. The 26th of April saw numerous tornadoes spawn across the Deep South, affecting Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. A total of 55 tornadoes were confirmed on the 26th with no fatalities recorded. But at the tail end of the day, a surface low pressure formed across Texas and deepened greatly. With this, and the strengthening of the low-level jet, created a viable environment for severe storms across the southeastern United States for the late night hours of the 26th into the early morning hours of the 27th. However, some meteorologists were surprised with how violent the storms of the morning hours were, such as former ABC 3340 meteorologist Jason Simpson. With the way that the system was set up, the southeastern United States was getting ready for a long, dark day ahead. In the late evening of the 26th into the early morning of the 27th, a squall line started to form over Louisiana and Arkansas, getting more organized around midnight in Mississippi. Tornado Genesis events within the squall line intensified drastically over Mississippi into Alabama. Most squall line systems generally don't produce many significant tornadoes. However, with this squall line, there are a total of 76 total tornadoes, with a total of three EF3 tornadoes. One in Culling, Alabama, another near Europa, Mississippi, and another in downtown Cordova, Alabama. The rest of the damage was caused by strong straight line winds and hail. By this point, the southeast was left in one of the worst possible scenarios the area could be in for an outbreak like this due to two reasons. The first of which being that due to the damage done because of the squall line, 
with the study concluding that the damage done knocked out power affecting non-functioning outdoor sirens and NOAA weather radios having outages, which resulted in the reduced ability to get warnings out to the public during the afternoon and evening hours. The second major issue being clearing across Mississippi, Alabama, and Tennessee. But why exactly is this an issue? With the sunshine, at least. Well, the issue is that because of the sun being out and there being clear skies, means that the added heat would further destabilize the atmosphere throughout the day. What made this worse was that the formation of a thermal boundary produced by the midday QLCS, which had a key role in the convective initiation of the storms that went along that boundary. The midday QLCS produced seven tornadoes, but helped to leave an environment ripe for a violent tornado outbreak made up of discrete supercells. And that is exactly what happened. The afternoon supercells began forming in Mississippi around 1 p.m. Central Daylight Time. The first cell to produce a major tornado ended up being an EF5 tornado that impacted the town of Philadelphia, Mississippi. The Philadelphia EF5 tornado touched down at about 2.30 p.m. on the northern side of the town of Philadelphia. The tornado caused extensive damage in northeast Oshoba, extreme northwest Kemper, extreme southeast Winston, and southwest Nuxerby counties in Mississippi. Much of the core was rated from high-end EF3 to EF5 damage. The damage path was 29 miles long, and the tornado was half a mile wide at one point in its life. The most notable statements from the National Weather Service for this tornado is that the damage included areas where the ground was scoured out to a depth of 2 feet in places, and asphalt was scoured off the pavement. The tornado dissipated around 3 p.m. Central Daylight Time, killing 3 and injuring 8. This was the first EF5 tornado to hit the state of Mississippi since May 3rd, 1966. At roughly the same time this tornado was happening, an EF4 tornado was striking the city of Coleman. The Coleman tornado formed around 2.40 p.m. Central Daylight Time to the north of Lewis Smith Lake, heading straight for downtown Coleman, Alabama. The tornado was caught on cam as it headed towards downtown Coleman. The tornado struck the city of Coleman as an EF4 with winds of up to 175 miles per hour, with the worst of the damage being along the Morgan-Marshall County line. The Coleman tornado dissipated at about 3.38 p.m., with the peak width of the tornado being one mile wide and was on the ground for 47 miles, killing six and injuring approximately 48 people. The deadliest tornado of the day was the Phil Campbell and Hackleberg tornado. The tornado touched down at approximately 3.05 p.m., traveling northeast and eventually making a beeline for the towns of Hackleberg and Phil Campbell. Both towns were practically wiped off the map from this tornado, with peak winds of 210 miles per hour. At its widest, the tornado was three quarters of a mile wide, and dissipated in Tennessee at around 5.40 p.m. The tornado killed 72 people, all in Alabama, making it the deadliest tornado in the state's history. The path also had the longest track out of any in the outbreak, with a path exceeding 132 miles. The Sipsy Cordova EF4 tornado touched down about three miles to the northeast of Pickensville in Pickens County at 3.40 p.m., and traveled to the northeast, hitting the town of Cordova, which was already hit by an EF3 tornado in the morning hours of the 27th. The tornado continued causing devastation before lifting southwest of Guntersville at 5.56 p.m. The peak winds were 170 miles per hour and a peak width of about four-fifths of a mile. The tornado was on the ground for approximately two and a half hours and had a damage path of 116.45 miles. 13 people were killed and 54 people were injured. At 3.40 p.m., the Smithville tornado formed southwest of the town of Smithville, and almost immediately started producing EF5 damage. Many homes and structures were swept away and completely obliterated by the tornado. Going through Smithville, shrubbery was ripped off the ground, and an SUV was thrown half a mile into the top of the local water tower, then traveled another half a mile before impacting the ground on the other side of the city, crushed into what seemed to be like a tidy ball. Many municipalities, such as the police department, city hall, and many churches were destroyed. The tornado continued northeast, causing damage into Itawamba County, Mississippi, and into Alabama, causing high-end EF2 to EF3 damage before dissipating at 4.23 p.m. Winds peaked at approximately 205 miles per hour in a peak width of three-fourths of a mile, traveling 35.1 miles. The Smithville tornado was one of the most violent tornadoes of the day. Not only was the damage done some of the most extreme of the outbreak, its intensity just after touching the ground is shocking. In total, 23 people were killed and 137 people were injured. The Flat Rock tornado formed near Highway 35 in Jackson County, Alabama at 4.01 p.m., making its way northeast towards Flat Rock, rapidly intensifying to a high-end EF4. The tornado destroyed mobile homes and block foundation houses as it made its way towards the Flat Rock area, with peak winds of 190 miles per hour. Most notably, a well-built block foundation home literally exploded as the tornado moved through. The tornado continued to move northeast with multiple cinder block foundation homes being destroyed. 
The tornado moved into Dade County, Georgia as an EF-3. The tornado moved through Trenton, Georgia before dissipating near Fort Oglethorpe at 4.57 p.m. At its widest, the tornado was one mile wide, traveling 47 miles total, killing 14 and injuring 50. A supercell thunderstorm produced a large wedge tornado in Greene County, Alabama at 4.43 p.m. The tornado was captured on film at about 4.50 p.m. by ABC 3340 meteorologist John Oldshue. The tornado was heading straight for the city of Tuscaloosa, one of the most populated cities in northern Alabama and home to the University of Alabama. The violent tornado marched towards Tuscaloosa, going through the southern and eastern portions of the city. The tornado strengthened to EF4 strength and demolished the areas where the tornado crossed. The tornado completely destroyed the Chaston Manor apartments and multiple buildings suffered extreme damage. All of this as the tornado was caught live on the tower camps of Tuscaloosa. The tornado continued northeast and was on a beeline towards the city of Birmingham, the most populous city in the northern part of the state. The tornado went through the northern suburbs of Birmingham at its peak, with winds of 190 miles per hour and a peak width of one and a half miles wide. Homes were swept away, and several suburbs suffered catastrophic damage. The tornado proceeded to rapidly weaken after moving through the suburb of Fultondale, and dissipated two miles to the north of Terrence at about 6.14 p.m. The final path length of the tornado was 80.68 miles. There was approximately $2.4 billion in damages, becoming the costliest tornado in recorded history at the time, before the record was broken less than a month later because of the Joplin tornado. In total, 64 people were killed and more than 1,500 injuries were reported. The Bridgeport tornado touched down near the town of Fackler at 5.05 p.m. The tornado reached its peak as an EF-4 with the residents being reduced to its foundation and multiple other well-built homes being reduced to their foundation and a concrete slab was pulled up from the front of a home. The tornado dissipated northeast of Haletown, Tennessee at 5.31 p.m. The tornado had peak winds of 180 miles per hour, traveling 30 miles with a peak width of three quarters of a mile, killing one. The Hale Enterprise tornado touched down near Raleigh, Mississippi at 5.42 p.m., traveling towards the northeast, slowly intensifying in the process. The tornado kept moving towards the northeast before intensifying to an EF3 low-end EF4 tornado, causing major damage in Jasper County. The tornado kept its strong intensity for a while, crossing over into Alabama and continuing to cause damage before it crossed into Perry County and lifted north of Uniontown, Alabama at 8.35 p.m. The Enterprise tornado was on the ground for nearly three hours, traveling a total of 122 miles, and at its peak, the tornado had winds of 175 miles per hour and at a peak width of three quarters of a mile, killing seven and injuring 17. The Rainsville tornado formed northeast of Geraldine, Alabama, roughly parallel to State Route 75. The initial damage was relatively minor. However, as the tornado moved into Rainsville, the damage was extensive. With a peak width of half a mile wide and winds of 200 miles per hour, the damage observed included houses that were completely removed off their foundations, and one observation of EF5 damage including homes ripped off of their foundations, and vehicles tossed hundreds of feet, and asphalt pulled up from the ground. The tornado proceeded to continue northeast before lifting near Rising Fawn in northwestern Georgia at 6.55 p.m. Central Daylight Time. In total, the tornado was on the ground for 36 and a half miles and killed 25. After the Tuscaloosa tornado lifted, the same supercell produced yet another tornado near Argo, Alabama at 6.28 p.m. The tornado caused relatively minor EF1 damage with most damage being done to trees. When the tornado crossed north of Odenville and turned further northeast, rapidly strengthening to an EF4, causing extensive damage. With six homes destroyed and only having small interior rooms remaining, and one house was swept off its foundation. As it continued further, the tornado reached its peak in Calhoun County with winds of 180 miles per hour, and a peak width of one mile. Numerous homes were destroyed, and it weakened to an EF2, then EF1 into Etowah County. The tornado intensified yet again with an EF3 rating in Cherokee County before weakening approaching the Alabama-Georgia state line. It strengthened into an EF2 again in northwest Georgia before dissipating in Bartow County at 7.45 p.m. In total, the tornado traveled 97 miles, killing 22 and injuring 85. The cell that produced the Rainsville EF5 tornado produced another violent tornado striking extreme North Georgia at 8.15 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The tornado traveled northeast and struck the town of Ringgold, Georgia. Its peak in Georgia had winds of 175 miles per hour after leaving the city of Ringgold, with most damage in Ringgold being EF2 to EF3 damage. Damage past Ringgold had 12 homes destroyed because of the tornado. 
As a tornado moved into Tennessee, strengthened to a high-end EF-4 with peak winds of 190 miles per hour, where large, well-built homes were swept away. The tornado weakened to an EF-1 before intensifying into an EF-2 near Athens, before lifting south of Athens, Tennessee at 9.07 p.m. At its peak, the Ringgold tornado had a width of 1.64 miles, killing 20 and injuring 335. With that, the last major tornado of the 27th had ended. Into the 28th, tornadoes continued to form but to a lesser degree of intensity, the strongest of which on the 28th being an EF3 tornado that struck the town of Gladespring, Virginia. 47 tornadoes formed on the 28th, the last of which forming and hitting eastern North Carolina, which was hit hard by the outbreak two weeks prior, but the tornadoes this time were relatively weak. There were multiple tornadoes that were reported on the 27th that happened outside of the area of the southeastern United States, many in the Ohio River Valley but these were relatively weak and short-lived. The other major components of this dangerous storm system came from the frequent flash flooding and the heavy rain over Missouri, northern Arkansas, Indiana, Kentucky, Illinois, and Tennessee. Large hail was prevalent with multiple of the supercells that formed that day, and strong straight-line winds. These other factors of the storm system were responsible for 24 deaths from this outbreak of severe weather. But as the storms left, the damage was seen, and it was worse than almost anyone could have imagined. The damage left behind was some of the worst in United States history, and only comparable to the April 1974 super outbreak. States of emergencies were declared in seven states, with the worst of the damage being in Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and Tennessee. President Obama signed federal disaster declarations for North Central Alabama and seven counties in Mississippi, those being Clark, Green, Hines, Jasper, Kemper, Lafayette, and Monroe. With Obama traveling to Tuscaloosa on the 29th to observe the damage, saying to the press, I've never seen devastation like this. In total, over 300 people died from this outbreak, the deadliest tornado outbreak since the Tri-State outbreak on March 28, 1925, with 253 of those deaths in Alabama alone. The death toll still remains the highest out of any tornado outbreak in the 21st century. This extremely high death toll from these tornadoes took a massive toll on the people affected, those who suffered from the storms, and prominently the meteorologists such as James Spann, who stood in front of a green screen for hours to warn as many people as he could of the dangers ahead. But answering as to why the death toll was so high, it's due to a lot of factors. The first factor had to do with the morning squall line. The morning squall line was responsible for knocking out power to at least a quarter million people in just northern Alabama also disrupting NOAA weather radio signals for the areas in North Alabama, and the power outages lasted for weeks. The second factor was that the sheer strength of some of these tornadoes. These tornadoes, especially in areas such as Hackleburg and Smithville, were strong to a point of where if you weren't underground, loss of life was very likely. But underground shelters in the southeast were not very common due to the issue of how expensive it was back in 2011 to build basements in some of these areas due to the ground composition. The third factor is that unlike the April 4th, 1974 outbreak, a large portion of these major tornadoes went through more urban and suburban areas such as Tuscaloosa and Birmingham. All of these reasons contributed to such a high death toll. In total, there were 348 deaths, with most of them being in Alabama. The cleanup effort took years in some locations, and some places weren't even rebuilt, mainly in the worst of the outbreaks such as Phil Campbell and Hackleburg. In total, there were $11 billion in damages, making it the costliest tornado outbreak in US history, along with the most tornadoes in a single tornado outbreak with a total of 362 confirmed tornadoes touching down over a four-day period. This outbreak remains in the minds of many people across the southeastern United States, and a life-changing day for many. The cleanup process took up a long time, but looking at some of the areas affected now in 2021, it's almost like it's back to what it was before the April 2011 super outbreak. They've rebuilt and come back after undoubtedly one of the darkest days in recent memory. The April 2011 super outbreak earned the title of a super outbreak. With the most tornadoes recorded from a single outbreak, alongside the most in a single day, and the costliest tornado outbreak in United States history, it's why I have decided to look back on this fateful day 10 years later. 
with this system being the most violent tornado outbreak in recent memory. Multiple meteorologists worked together to get the message out about this violent system of tornadoes moving through, saving hundreds of thousands of lives that day. Meteorologists such as Jason Simpson and James Spann, who people said that without him on the 27th, they might not be alive. The storm chasers such as Reed Timmer, who tracked these powerful tornadoes on the ground and warned people and the authorities of the tornadoes ongoing. The storm chasers and meteorologists from that day deserve the utmost respect, and it's why this video is dedicated to just about any and all meteorologists out there helping to warn those of severe weather. Could an outbreak like this happen again? It's certainly possible, but there isn't much else to say on that topic besides that. This outbreak was also the reason I got invested into the subject of meteorology, and while not being affected by the brunt of the system, it's why I hold the 2011 super outbreak so close to me as a person. That being said, 10 years later, the southeastern United States is strengthened up, and that fateful day 10 years ago serves as a reminder as to why tornado warnings should be taken seriously. All footage, music, and sources that I use to make this video will be linked to two paste bins in the description. Special thanks to Force 13 US, specifically Thomas Schwent and Noah, for helping correct information and add on to what I already wrote here. Anyways, I'm Alfaria, you all have a good one, and make sure to share this around to those who don't know what made this day so important 10 years ago.